I think we're going to get going on our uh, Quest for a Cure uh, uh, seminar tonight. So welcome to the Quest for a Cure Progress in Cancer Research uh, Starlight Lecture Series. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This has been an exciting series for us here. Uh, and today's is going to focus on brain cancer research. So I'm Joe W. Ramos. I'm the deputy director here at the Cancer Center. Uh, I do brain cancer research myself, and I'm going to be the host for you this afternoon in this webinar. Uh, please note the webinar is going to be is being recorded, and the recording, along with the presentation slides, will be posted to the UH Cancer Center website uh, as soon as they're available. You'll see that the, the chat box is turned off. Uh, but if you'd like to submit your questions, please do so using the Q&A box instead. You'll see that is also at the bottom there. Um, and so we'll be monitoring questions in our Q&A box, and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, also, there'll be a survey link that's going to be displayed in the chat box during the Q&A session, and you can provide feedback there. Uh, but there'll also be an email sent to you the next day uh, with a survey link in that. Uh, and there will be a special thank you if you fill out the survey with a little Mahalo gift um, mailed to you. All right, so as I said tonight, we're focused on brain cancer. So you may or may not know this is a, this is a fairly rare cancer. We have about 67 uh, adults diagnosed annually with this brain cancer or other nervous system cancers in Hawaii. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, each year. Approximately 70% of those individuals do die from the disease. So this is a, uh, a very uh, nasty brain cancer, a nasty kind of tumor. Uh, and in dire need of new treatments and new therapies for the more advanced kinds of brain cancers. You'll learn tonight that there are a number of different kinds of brain cancers and each one has its own um, uh, challenges. And, uh, and so we're gonna just jump into it. Uh, we're really lucky to have Dr. Thomas No and Dr. Christina Spires with us. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, first up in our, in our series is Dr. Thomas No, who's a neurosurgeon from Kapiolani Medical Center for Women and Children. Polymomi Medical Center, Straub Medical Center, and Wilcox Medical Center. Um, he was born and raised here in Honolulu. I uh, completed medical school at the John A. Burns uh, School of Medicine here in, uh, across the way from me. Trained at the Henry Ford Hospital after that and pursued a fellowship in brain tumor surgery at Harvard's Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's currently an assistant professor in the departments of surgery, anatomy, and medical education at Japsum. Uh, and he has a lab focused there on surgical innovations. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. No. Great. Thanks for that um, introduction, Joe. Um, so let me see. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Is that working? Yes. Great. OK. So, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to go over um, some of the surgical adjuncts that we use for uh, brain tumor surgery. Um, and uh, again, um, you know, it, especially in this day and age, you know, I, I feel very sort of fortunate to be working uh, where we can do this sort of rapid data transfer. We can do these Zoom meetings. We can do and stay very interconnected, um, even at our own computers. And I think this is really where technology is sort of outpacing our ability to even understand, you know, things like deep learning. And, and so as clinicians, you know, I really feel that there's like an immense opportunity uh, and an advantage for us to really innovate and come up with new solutions. Um, and so again, um, you know, my interests lie in developing better tools to do better surgery, basically, for all kinds of brain tumors. Um, but I really wanted to take the time today to talk about a specific type of tumor um, and really use it as, as an example of how we do better surgery in the brain. Um, you know, I, I this is many people um, may not recognize this, but this is an MRI of the brain with a tumor um, that sits in a somewhat eloquent area in a sort of important part of the brain. And what I want to show you today is how we apply some of the um, so surgical concepts basically to trying to take out these tumors and to a re cytal reduce or reduce the number of cells that are in the brain um, and that have uh, and that are causing the cancer. Um, and so again, this is one of the more challenging tumors that we face. This is a, what we call a glioma. Um, and this one is likely high grade. Um, the prognosis of something like this is very dismal. And although surgery is an established paradigm in the treatment of this disease, one of the challenges that we face as surgeons is balancing gross total resection. In other words, trying to get all of that white stuff that sits in the bottom right corner um, uh, with basically over resecting or causing, causing deficits. And so Today, I wanted to go over some of the tools that we use to basically help us treat, pre, treat these tumors, as well as some of the innovations that we're developing. 
So in 2019, the American Cancer Society um, estimated about 24,000 new cases um, with about 18,000 deaths. Um, gliomas as a whole account for approximately about 27% of all primary brain tumors. Um, and with about 56% of these cases being GBMs, um, which is the most dreaded form of glioma. Uh, and again, GBM stands for glioblastoma, um, which is uh, the most aggressive form. Um, survival time, you know, after diagnosis varies significantly by grade. Um, I don't want you to pay too much attention to all the little, you know, variations, but um, more recently, efforts in precision medicine have allowed us to determine important prognostic mutations uh, in these tumors. And so treatment options um, these days are actually based on their molecular features sometimes. And so talking a little bit more pro about prognosis, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the majority of gliomas, they carry a pretty poor prognosis. And this is something around the five-year survival of about 5%. Um, you know, the best therapy that we currently have uh, is the current standard of care, um, and it's called the STUP protocol, um, which is basically, uh, it's um, a short, short name basically for a series of uh, a surgery, uh, radiation, and chemotherapy. And so for newly diagnosed um, GBMs, surgery is followed um, with this sort of paradigm. Uh, and the median survival, again, even with this, um, is on average uh, a dismal 12 months. And, and this is really the, the main reason that gliomas are challenging is that um, because they're a very infiltrative disease, um, they're constantly changing. And another problem is that they have really different types of um, molecular markers and that can make finding a sort of final common pathway really tough. And so that means that even though we saw that one picture that had that little bit of, in, uh, of contrast leakage, um, you, basically already have tumors spread out through the entire brain. Um, and many times it's just a red herring um, because the tumor is already diffusely spread uh, and oftentimes mutated even. But, you know, despite the slow progress, the average survival for patients has increased steadily just even over the course of say 10 years. Um, and I think this graph itself is, it's actually a bit dated, but it only takes into account the average survival, which is up to um, 2010. So that makes this about 10 years old. Um, but I do believe that a lot of this is due to the evidence um, and sort of the evidence-based, you know, surgical and oncologic changes that we've made, um, you know, things like even multidisciplinary tumor boards, uh, which we do now here uh, in the HPH system, um, and personalized medicine. And these things really, uh, even though it's just something as easy as collaboration, uh, has played a central role and I think is crucial to raising this survival curve. And so one of the you know, examples of things that I've worked on before um, uh, really is towards moving you know, towards options that, that may be a little bit outside the box. Um, and this is just one of those examples. This is what we call the exablate blood brain barrier disruption trial. And that's really um, a fancy way of sort of saying we used ultrasound to sort of open up some of the blood vessels in the brain, which then allow chemotherapeutic agents to actually infiltrate the brain better. And so by getting more chemotherapy, the thought is if you can get more chemotherapy into the brain, then perhaps um, that chemotherapy may be more effective and attack the tumor better. And so um, this is a, a technology that um, basically concentrates the ultrasound. Um, you give patients an IV bubble type of solution, and then the, bubble, the bubbles actually oscillate uh, within the blood vessels and open up um, the channels in between them and cause more leakage basically of chemotherapy. Um, but again, this is not something that we do routinely. And so, you know, this is uh, a, a clinical trial that uh, I'm a part of at the Cancer Center, where, we're, again, we're taking some of these patients and we're giving them the standard of care, which is what I mentioned earlier, of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. But then on top of that, adding a new type of chemotherapy that's found to sort of be really robust in some other types of cancers and sort of just asking the question, well, if we added on these other types of drugs, does this potentially increase survival? And, and um, that's an unknown. We really don't know. And so that's why these clinical trials are, are so important towards finding um, better therapies and better cures for these patients. So going back to the same patient, we know that you know the STU protocol, again, is surgery, chemo, and radiation. And what I want to touch on for the next few minutes is how surgery is actually the most modifiable pillar of, of these three things. Um, and 
And so the reason why I wanted to emphasize this, this slide is, and again, I don't want to bore you too much with all the data and all of this, but as our imaging techniques have improved over time, we have an ability now more than ever before to help ourselves in, in resecting some of these tumors and very innovative tools that can help us guide and pursue a maximally safe resection. And you can see how important that is um, because people who have some type of deficit, whether it be a language or motor, they just do less better overall. Uh, and so it's really important for us as surgeons to sort of take care um, and try to get as much of the tumor without causing uh, any problems. And so um, this patient again, um, you know, just as an example, how do we get to that tumor? Well, um, we use things like neuronavigation to help us get there. And what this is, is basically a combination of a camera and um, some trackers in space, much like the same things that show up in video games um, to basically give us a GPS system for the head. Um, and this takes into account very simple things like these contrast filled um, bubbles um, or things like um, uh, the anatomical features on, on a baby's face, uh, nasion and tragus. That's my daughter helping me out with my presentation. Um, and then, you know, what we've done, uh, for example, in my lab is sort of push this technology forward a little bit by saying, well, this machine is quite bulky and big. Uh, and we have things like iPhones that can recognize our face way better than that thing can. Um, so why aren't we using that technology? And um, these are the simple questions that we can ask to sort of um, uh, advance things and push things forward. Um, and we've taken that even a step further um, by being able to take um, anatomical things and put them basically into a space. And so you can imagine being able to do things like, for example, show, you know, show people their tumors and where it is relative to their brain, or even use these things in the operating room to give us a better idea about where the tumor is relative to what we're seeing. Um, and so we're really pushing things like even basic things like neuronavigation to, um, to new levels. Uh, intraoperative MRI is another thing that's important for us, an important tool for us to have. Um, what it does is it basically helps us to get an MRI right after we're done with our surgery. And what we can do is you know, identify things like an incomplete resection, um, after the MRI is obtained, we can actually re-register our GPS system. Um, and this is really helpful for things that uh, sometimes don't show up to the naked eye. So for example, when we open up a brain, oftentimes there's tissue in there that, we, um, that looks just like normal brain, but is actually tumor. And so that's uh, where sometimes tumors can be missed. And so um, that, this is why the intraoperative MRI is so helpful. Um, and, and why I get an MRI um, whenever I do my resections um, in the middle of the, or after we feel like we've done all that we can. Uh, intraoperative uh, 3D ultrasound is another uh, new tool that we have that um, basically gives us real-time imaging and can also allow for re-registration uh, after brain shift. Um, what happens after uh, the brain is opened up is that um, uh, the skull itself is rigid, but the brain itself is actually a little bit jello-like, and so it moves um, after the, the, the skull is opened. And so um, one of the challenges is following the brain and sort of making sure that our GPS system is accurate. Um, and this is where ultrasound can help us and play a role. Um, fMRI is also one of the more commonly uh, used imaging studies that um, basically gives us an idea about where your functionality might be. Um, and can help us determine if the lesion is basically involved with key functional things like language um, and basically what gives me more uh, confidence during the resection to be um, to say well you know this is this is the area that we definitely should be avoiding um, and and another tool that we use on just um, uh, along with that is diffusion tensor imaging which basically allows us to see the connections between different parts of the brain um, and again, import this into our GPS system and allow us to basically drive through the brain um, and do a complete resection. And so at the end of the day, this is what you're hoping for. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are other therapies um, that I'm, I won't get too much, I don't have too much time today to get into, but um, laser thermal ablation or lit, uh, commonly known as LIT, L-I-T-T, uh, is a, a new type of technology that um, has recently come about. And what it is, is basically, uh, if you can get um, tumor tissue essentially to anywhere past 43 degrees, 
the cells within the tumor will die. And so this is a new sort of option that we have in our armamentarium. Um, and so uh, what this requires is basically a combination of uh, uh, an MRI machine and a laser catheter. Um, and we can now take care of deeper lesions inside of the brain. Um, instead of doing big open surgeries, we can create a more minimally invasive incision, which sometimes uh, can be as small as um, you know, a half a centimeter. Um, and get to tumors that are very, very deep in the brain and naturally and, and, and previously uh, thought to be unresectable. Uh, the, uh, this is sort of just an example of the sharp transition zone that, that basically uh, you get whenever we do one of these types of ablations. This is obviously in a, in a, a sample that's been taken out. And you know, the advantage of this is that you get shorter hospital stays, you get uh, reduced blood loss, uh, less post-operative pain, and an ability basically to provide adjuvant radiation sooner, um, as well as get to things like radiation necrosis, which is uh, one of the things that can happen after um, having radiation to a, a lesion. Um, there are some disadvantages with this as well, but this is something that we uh, consider whenever we're um, planning one of these or are offering this type of treatment to, to a patient. And so, you know, going back to this curve, I think the, you know, the hope is that with all the different innovations that, um, that we do come up with, um, that, you know, really at the end of the day, um, we're sort of working together uh, with people like Joe and Christina and really just trying to push the curve as much as possible as we can um, towards something a little bit like that blue line. Um, and a lot of it, you know, is, is rapidly changing. We have newer therapies every single day um, and newer options, uh, particularly things like even some of the clinical trials I talked about earlier are being done um, sort of in adaptive trials. And so these are important things that we need to look towards in the future um, to come up uh, exponentially in some ways with, with solutions. And so my hope and dream obviously is to uh, push this curve up to where the blue line is. Um, but I think that'll only come uh, with collaboration with people um, like Joe. I mean, working on the front lines of basically trying to find um, chemotherapeutic or understanding the molecular biology of how these tumors move um, is critical because surgery is just one component of it. But the reality is that this disease is oftentimes spread beyond that. And so we really need to be focused on, you know, trying to find uh, a way to, um, uh, to sort of attack each and every cell uh, in the brain. And so I'll, I'll stop there for now. And if there are any questions, um, I will try to look for them in the, uh, the Q&A box. And bear with me because I'm not I'm new at this with the Q&A box. Um, if there are questions. Yeah, I think we'll do the, um, the Q&A session at the end together. Um, and, uh, and so uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. No. Uh, we'll go to our second speaker now. Um, so uh, it's a, we're moving sort of down the stoop protocol. So we've lear learned a little more from the surgery side. Uh, so our, our next speaker is Dr. Christina Spears who's a radiation oncologist with the uh, Cancer Center of Hawaii. Um, she was also born here in Oahu, so we have a lot of great homegrown talent tonight. Uh, she attended uh, Chaminade University here and then went on for her medical education at Vanderbilt Medical School. She got both a doctorate of medicine and a doctor of philosophy, her MD and her PhD there. Uh, then she did a residency at Seitman Cancer Center at the Washington University, uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital. Um, and. Uh, I guess finally uh, mentioned that she also did some research at the National Institutes of Health uh, in virology. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Spears. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramos. Let me share my screen. Hi, so my name is Christina Spears and I am a radiation oncologist or a cancer doctor that treats patients with radiation. I work at the Cancer Center of Hawaii and today I'm pleased to talk to you about radiation therapy for brain cancer or aiming more to shoot less. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. So today we're going to talk about radiation therapy for brain cancer in adults and children. As these, as these patient populations have distinct disease types. 
And interspersed in this discussion, I will be raising um, a discussion on targeting treatment. Um, and anytime I do, uh, I will talk of um, this little uh, orange head will pop up um, just to signal that, you know, the, the goal of this talk is to discuss how to provide more effective treatments that have fewer side effects. And lastly, um, we'll talk about some screening symptoms um, that may be of interest to the public to know about in presentation of brain cancer. So I'd like to begin with a case study. A 44-year-old man, uh, while on vacation, develops weakness and disorientation. He had a history of a stroke three years prior with few residual symptoms. He underwent a medical evaluation and unfortunately a brain MRI revealed a brain tumor or a glioblastoma. So he underwent surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, but unfortunately his disease recurred and he passed away two years later. So if this example sounds familiar, it's because it is. Um, it's our president's late son, Bo Biden. And this just goes to show that you know many people, uh, both in the news and people that you have known have succumbed to brain cancer. And so it's something that affects each and every one of us. So to begin, I'd like to talk about the site of brain cancers and um, how they can be metastatic and primary. And let me define that for you. So metastatic brain cancers are cancers that have spread from another site of the body. And that is actually the more common type of brain cancer um, with more diagnoses than primary brain cancers, which arise from within the brain. Lung and breast is the most common site of origin for brain tumors. And um, so we'll talk about those first and then move on to primary brain cancers afterwards. For metastatic brain tumors, uh, the first step of diagnosis is often a PAN scan. So you must identify where the tumor arose from to identify how to treat it. And of course, treating the brain is secondary, biopsies are sometimes involved, but the first thing to do is often to get a scan like this, a CAT scan or a computed tomography scan, sometimes a PET scan, um, these scans are uh, used to identify whether a tumor is located elsewhere in the body that can kind of tell you what the tissue type that led to the brain cancer is. And while it's beyond the scope of this talk, the next step would be seeing a medical oncologist to discuss systemic therapy. And so this is our first little orange head because um, I have been amazed at just in the last decade how much more targeted um, and effective systemic therapy has become in comparison to what many people think of uh, as standard chemotherapy regimens. Um, and this has led to more effective treatments and safer treatments as well. So as Dr. Noah alluded to, um, any type of brain cancer, but especially metastatic brain cancers, um, are best managed using multidisciplinary care. So this includes surgery, and he's given you a beautiful introduction on that. Um, systemic therapy, as I mentioned, and then radiation therapy. And what can never be missed is the use of supportive care, not only from the point of diagnosis, but all the way to end of life care. And so my job will be to talk to you a little bit more about radiation. I promise I won't get too nerdy, but I want to start off with a pretty nerdy picture that many of you may have seen um, in school. Radiation is just a form of energy. So if you look at this picture, um, as you uh, kind of recognize some of these things like radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, the radiation I'll be talking about today occupies the right side. So this is smaller wavelengths, which is a way to describe energy and higher energy. So basically radiation is a way we can use energy to commandeer and treat uh, patients with cancer to kill cancer cells. So a way of looking at this is that radiation therapy can be targeted, and you have that little orange head here, by targeting using imaging to an area of tumor. So you have spatial localization there. And when you apply radiation, radiation causes damage to a number of different components, but the most important is DNA. And cancer cells, unlike normal cells, often can't repair their DNA, and so they're more sensitive to the damage exerted by radiation. Whereas healthy cells, as long as it's below a certain dose limit, are able to repair the DNA damage. This can be even more targeted by combining radiation therapy with systemic therapy that might increase the effect of radiation on cancer cells 
by depriving them of the ability to repair that damage. And so what this potentially could mean is sensitizing cells in a particular tissue or a particular compartment so that we need lower doses of radiation, which might cause fewer side effects and more effective treatment. So that's very exciting. Um, for metastatic brain tumors, sometimes we do have to treat a large target, and it really just depends on where the disease is. So as part of the workup, uh, as Dr. No mentioned, um, you know, brain MRIs are very, very commonly obtained to describe where the tumor is, the number of tumors, and the size of tumors. So in this example, um, you see that high brain radiation doses are in red, whereas low doses are in blue and green. And sometimes because of the number and the size of tumors, we do have to treat the whole brain. But this is not ideal. I mean, giving a high dose of radiation to the tumor makes sense, but giving a very uh, diffuse uh, cloud of dose to the rest of the brain is not ideal, can affect memory, can cause radiation necrosis or scar tissue or inflammation um, that uh, Dr. No alluded to. And so over time, we have kind of uh, tried to continue to give the um, necessary dose to the tumor, but decrease the amount of dose spread. But here you can see that while there's more unirradiated brain tissue, you still have quite a bit of volume getting low and medium doses, which in some cases is clinically impactful. So the favored approach for metastatic brain tumors at this time is to treat high doses to the area of need and really minimize where the radiation is going. And so for a patient with a small number of tumors or with very small tumors, this is a more targeted treatment that is going to provide better quality of life, but still provide local control, meaning the ability to control where that cancer is. However, even when the whole brain must be treated, we can still try to target the treatment to make it more effective and safe. So some of you may have heard of the hippocampus, which is one of our memory centers. And we know that it's one of our memory centers because when it's affected in Alzheimer's disease or with traumatic brain injuries, patients lose the ability to um, make memories effectively. And so this has been studied with radiation therapy, where, as you can see, here's a picture of the hippocampus on the left, and they're called hippocampi when they're impaired. And on the right uh, is a radiation dose wash. So high doses, again, are in red, going to low doses, which are in blue. This is the hippocampus, which I hope you can compare to this one on the left. And here, the hippocampus is getting a very low dose. And what they found on this study was when they did so, that patients had much better brain function as tested by cognitive tests and also as reported by the patients themselves. And so this has been an, an effort made to decrease toxicity um, as long as tumors were not located in or near this organ and thereby give more effective and safe treatment. So next I'd like to talk about primary brain tumors, which are the other category. So for primary brain tumors, um, tissue and gene analysis is critical to determining the best and safest treatment. This is not a pathology talk. I'm not gonna get into too much detail. However, the first best step is to have a pathologist identify what is the tissue type for this cancer cell? Is it a brain tumor as Dr. No was discussing and those break down into further categories? or is it a supportive cell or a non-brain tumor that still is located within the brain? Each of these can lead to cancers and each of these are managed in a different way. But something that has um, been uh, the leading edge of research um, by researchers such as Dr. Ramos is looking at, you know, what can we identify uh, beyond just the tissue type? What are perhaps the changes that uh, are associated with these uh, less aggressive and more aggressive tumors, what drives growth of these tumors, and how does that correlate to the behavior. So there's a lot of text on this slide, and I don't want you to focus too much on the text. Just follow this slide where it says lower grade gliomas, which are less aggressive brain tumors or brain cancers. And each of these has genetic signatures that correlate with the uh, less aggressive behavior. And so this has been incredibly important to subcategorize these tumors to identify where can we de-escalate treatment, where can we omit radiation, and where can we potentially just watch patients after surgery. Whereas on the right side with these high-grade gliomas, um, it's so important to find these driver mutations that can be um, further targeted with uh, therapies 
that might improve um, the efficacy of treatment for these aggressive tumors while still minimizing off-target effects and specificity of treatment. So we talked about adults and we talked about primary cancers. I'd like to then move into children. Um, so I am one of the pediatric radiation oncologists at our center. And so um, just uh, a little bit on, on pediatric and young adults. They have very different brain cancers than adults do, but the general approach is the same. We start off with identifying what is the tissue subtype? Where did the cancer arise? So here is a really beautiful um, schematic looking at the top of the brain, the back of the brain or the posterior fossa, and of course the spine. And each of these subsites gives rise to different tumor types, which can then be which can then be associated with different genetic changes and different behaviors. So this subcategorization is so critical to identifying what the best treatment is. But again, it doesn't stop there. We want to find what are the genetic changes, what drives growth of these tumors, how can this uh, be from bench to bedside um, a, a, a leaping point for better, safer targeted therapies. So going into my second case study, a 13-year-old boy presents uh, with three weeks of morning headaches, vomiting, and imbalance. His parents become very concerned and bring him to his primary doctor. An MRI is done, as you can see here, this is a horizontal slice and shows this abnormality in orange um, near the cerebellum or the back of the brain. And so this child was diagnosed with a medulloblastoma. There's a lot of information on this slide. I just want to take away three points, which is that medulloblastoma is one of the most common CNS tumors in children. It is a cancer that arises from the cerebellum, which can also spread to the spinal cord that impacts how we treat with radiation. And here, that uh, the area of the brain in which these tumors arise associates with the risk stratification and potentially the genetic drivers, although there are some genetic predispositions in this group of patients. However, the most important part of this slide to me is this group on the right, where you can see there are four different groups um, which are broken down by the genetic changes that may be driving uh, carcinogenesis or development of these cancers. And in some of them, we can potentially de-escalate therapy. Think about reducing or omitting radiation. Whereas others where there is higher risk of metastasis, it's important to identify these so that we can do targeted therapies more early on to decrease the chance of metastasis later on. So medulloblastoma is again best treated in a multidisciplinary fashion with surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And um, just moving along, I'm going to um, talk about the radiation part of it, where, as I mentioned, because medulloblastoma can involve the spine, uh, we treat the brain and the spine. And so this is, as you can see in this figure right here, a very large volume. Traditionally, we would treat the brain and the spine to a medium dose, treat the area where the tumor arose to a high dose. But I hope you can appreciate here in blue and green how much of this child's body gets radiation exposure. So this is moved to using in children where this is appropriate, proton therapy. Proton therapy is another modality of radiation, different than the hard x-rays that I talked to you about. In this type of therapy, we are able to stop radiation exposure in tissues, meaning the, the, um, the dose exposure can be stopped in tissues, and that leads to a larger volume of unirradiated dose. So if we look at this child who has received proton therapy to the cranial spinal region. This still allows for a significant volume of tissue that is not radiated, which can potentially decrease the risk of future growth effects or cancer from treatment um, and uh, among other possible side effects. This continues to be evaluated and there is still ongoing research to determine if we further um, refine our volumes and decrease even the vertebral column, do we then see better outcomes as well? So this is something very exciting in radiation oncology and something that we think is really important uh, with pediatric cancers. 
As you can see, pediatric cancer management is incredibly complex, and so I believe that these patients are best managed on a clinical trial. As I said before, bench to bedside, where um, the uh, ex most exciting research coming out um, on these cancers is then brought through multiple phases of a clinical trial so that in phase three, we compare it with the standard of care so that we can identify what are the best treatments that actually improve outcomes before FDA approval. However, I don't want to um, uh, be too uh, optimistic about this. There are still you know, significant long-term follow-up that is needed for these children. And so I just wanted to alert the public's attention to the Children's Oncology Group, where there is multi-system long-term follow-up that assists clinicians in following these children after they undergo these complex treatments. So just in the last couple of minutes, um, while there are no screening tests recommended for the public for brain cancers, I just wanted to identify a couple of symptoms that may alert you or your family member to seek medical um, uh, advice. And uh, these can be subjective changes like appetite changes, balance, motor or sensory changes, or objective changes like loss in weight, changes in vision, and neurological testing changes. Cytocare and uh, Moffitt Cancer Center have put together these uh, two really nice graphics, which are uh, nice reminders of these symptoms, including headaches, nausea or vomiting, issues with vision, hearing loss, issues with balance, sleep-wake disturbances, confusion, seizures, uh, trouble swallowing or controlling your facial muscles, um, prolonged unexplained fatigue, and other symptoms. And so um, for my last slide, in summary, uh, brain cancer is best managed with targeted treatment that improves outcomes and minimizes side effects. I hope I've convinced you of that. And as the uh, subtitle says, that we really want to aim more to shoot less. And uh, so that some of the um, examples that I've raised are using better molecular and genetic targeting, which has come such a long way and is so exciting using radiation sensitizers so that perhaps we use lower radiation doses while also potentially increasing specificity in tissues or compartments within the body, using better imaging to target radiation in a more precise and accurate fashion, and hopefully using tar um, smaller targets in order to improve quality of life. And shooting less includes finding risk groups where we can de-escalate treatment and either decrease radiation dose volumes or even omit treatment um, spare organs so that patients have fewer side brain radiation therapy and identifying modalities that are appropriate for use where we can get really good outcomes but as few side effects as possible. Thank you so much for your attention and with that I'll take any questions. Great, thank you Dr. Spears. Um, and uh, we're going to move into our Q&A session now which will have all of the panelists available for your questions. Um, so please, I encourage everyone, if you have a question, to please type it into the Q&A. Again, that should be in the bottom of your Zoom screen, right to the right. It has a little number two on it now because we have our two first questions here ready to go. Um, I think everybody's learned how complex this cancer is and how many different kinds there are and some of the things going on with the advances in treating it. Uh, so um, we have our first questions over here. Um, Dr. Spears and No, can you see the questions or would you like me to read them? No, I could see them. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so our first question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I'll read it for the, I guess, for the group. Uh, the, this attendee says that uh, their mother was diagnosed with glioblastoma at the age of 83. She declined treatment and passed away three months later. Um, the questions were, one, her general health was good. Had she accepted treatment, surgery, chemo, and radiation, how severe would this process be? In other words, what would have been her quality of life? What would have been her average life expectancy then? And then secondly, are glioblastomas hereditary? I can maybe take that question, you know, because this is a conversation many times that I have many times because I'm usually the first person to see these patients um, when they first present, oftentimes with, um, as Dr. Spears said, with uh, a variety of symptoms. But the first thing that I always bring up is, um, you know, how would they want to be treated? And oftentimes, you know, uh, the, the most important piece of, of all the treatment that we do is that it, it's a partnership, right? It's, it's um, uh, me being able to give information and sort of say, well, look, 
<clears throat> we know with even surgery and chemotherapy and radiation, even with the best treatments that we have, your average survival may be 12 months. And so, um, you know, we can certainly take a gamble with that um, and sort of the upfront risk to some of that is surgery and some of the side effects that may come from chemo and radiation, um, which you can certainly also stop along the way. Um, but, but, you know, they may come at a certain price and some people are very much on board with sort of being like, yes, let's do everything possible. And there are just as many people who say, well, you know, I, I lived a good long life and I'm you know, sort of happy with everything that uh, has turned out the way it has. And so, you know, even though it may be three months, I'm comfortable with three months. And so, um, uh, you know, I think that's one of the hardest parts of my job sometimes is sort of really trying to uh, assess that. Um, and it's sometimes it is sort of a, um, a skill, but it's really just, I think it's just becoming friends sort of with, with the patient and trying to um, manage their expectations in some ways um, with with what might happen. Right. Dr. I Spears? I agree with everything Dr. No just said. Um, in terms of the radiation, uh, you know, it tends to, to work alongside with chemotherapy. So um, it's a discussion alongside the medical oncologist and the patient, and of course the family to try to set expectations, to determine, you know, how, what is their baseline? What, uh, uh, how has this treatment or how, excuse me, how has the tumor impacted their baseline function already? And how does the family feel about that? Um, I, you know, in, in terms of glioblastoma, uh, the treatment can extend to all the way to six weeks of treatment. That's a lot for some families and patients to swallow because it is daily treatment and they do get significantly tired anytime you treat the brain. Um, fatigue, among other side effects, is, is huge. And sometimes it's um, uh, having that discussion, as Dr. No said, that you know, you're gonna, even if you feel better at the end, or even if we stabilize things at the end, overall the prognosis is, is not great. And oftentimes with the treatment, you will feel worse before you feel better. Um, and so once families know what to expect while still understanding that every person is different, then they can kind of frame their expectations. Uh, there have been studies suggesting that if we shorten the radiation, so instead of six weeks going to three weeks, or sometimes even shorter, that we can still often get uh, good outcomes. And so um, I, I think talking to families at that level saying, okay, maybe we're not doing the six weeks of treatment, but if we wanted to stabilize growth, um, do you think you can take on five weeks, I mean, excuse me, three weeks of treatment? And sometimes that's exactly what they want to hear. Um, but I think what we try to do as a multidisciplinary team is always be open to the idea that just as other um, decided, you know, that they don't want to do treatment or they want to stop treatment early. And I think that's part of this whole process. Thank you. I remember her second question was, are glioblastomas hereditary? There are certain syndromes where um, gliomas are a part of um, of that, and and I'll be honest, it's the, those syndromes are oftentimes very rare. Um, but in in terms of uh, uh, of actual very sort of common types of things, that that's almost a case by case sort of thing because there certainly are family linked history types of gliomas, um, but at the same time they're they're very very rare, um, and so that always comes up almost with on a, on, a, um, uh, on a geneticist's radar, for example. Um, but, um, but, but so in other words, to answer the question, yeah, there are some forms, but, um, but not very common. Yes, very, very rare ones. So our next question is also from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they've read the, about the hope of raising antibodies to glioblastoma and why hasn't this been successful? And is there not enough time that I guess they're proposing a possible answer there? But I, I think this is basically what kinds of uh, immunotherapies, ways of using the immune system to treat glioblastoma uh, have been uh, checked out and tested and maybe coming down the line? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a good, another interesting question. I mean, I, I guess I'd like to answer that one because uh, that's the clinical trial that I'm currently running actually at, at the cancer center is, you know, using immunotherapy to see if, if this is a good um, uh, potential way of, you know, uh, of increasing um, uh, the, or, you know, uh, providing a better prognosis. 
Um, in terms of raising antibodies, for example, through like xenographic models and things of that sort, we know that you know, oftentimes we can raise these antibodies, for example, even in animal models, but when that's applied to humans, for some weird reason, there is not a translation. and We don't quite understand why. Um, again, I'm not uh, an expert in that field, but that's what I've been, uh, that's what I've read and sort of understood um, in trying to raise antibodies. I think there was the DC Vax trial, uh, which is still pending maturation. We don't have a good we don't have good results from that. Um, my understanding, and Dr. No would be much better at answering this than I, um, was that uh, in enrolling patients on this trial, that a significant um, uh, size of uh, brain specimen was needed. So. Uh, just in terms of um, having patients go through that, some of them were not eligible. And it takes time, as uh, the questioner indicated, uh, to raise these antibodies and then, of course, to use them in the patient. I think early um, findings were promising, um, but uh, we're still holding our breath for those results. But um, as Dr. Noah alluded to, you know, um, uh, stimulating the immune system can come through a wide variety of ways, and that was the, one of the approaches. Yeah, I can note having seen a lot of grants in these areas recently, there's a lot of work still going on in this area. So there are new attempts to try and improve vaccines and, and that line of attack. There's actually some new CAR T therapies where you engineer your T cells to attack the tumor uh, that are being tried uh, again. Uh, and then the, uh, the checkpoint inhibitor, these, in, these other ways of, of uh, increasing the immune response, uh, which have not done great so far, but there's more and more activity to try and figure out how to make them better. So maybe we'll still see some really great new advances in that area down the way. Okay, we have our next question. This one is, uh, how far along are we on CRISPR LNP to treat um, uh, brain tumors? Can you explain what research is being done on this? Anyone sure. want to take a stab at that? I was going to say, I feel like it's a question <laughs> Joe might be able to answer. <laughs> um, I haven't seen anything uh, so far that, uh, in the CRISPR realm uh, for brain tumors. Uh, I was curious if either of you had seen anything coming down the lines, but uh, that's, that's not an area that I'm, uh, I'm aware of uh, any new results on yet. No, I mean, that's uh, it's taking me back to nostalgia, back to my PhD days, because this is, you know, you know gene editing. And um, while it's very promising, I uh, am also not aware of any uh, mature data uh, that I think would, would um, shortly make the leap to the clinic. Thanks. Uh, another question, anonymous attendee. Um, someone said, thank you both. It's not a question, it's a comment. Thank you, both of you, for a wonderful, approachable presentation. I would echo that. Uh, okay, um, another question here. Uh, are there any specific genetic mutations that can alert for the potential of having brain cancer, like BRCA2 does for breast cancer? That's a good one for you guys. So, so um, Christina, sorry, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I, I was just going to say it's somewhat similar to I think the question we had earlier, which was you know about hereditary syndromes and while they do exist, I think they're um, they're very rare. Um, and it's a, a question that we get often is that you know is do I need to test my kids? And um, and I think the the sort of short answer that I usually give is you know this is very very rare unless there were some other odd things that stood out like particular types of skin cancers or things like that. Um, then we wouldn't be worried and we wouldn't. I recommend that. Um, so if I can treat, keep track of the points in my head, I wanted to raise three things about this. And one is that, um, you know, for the slide that I showed for pediatric brain cancers, um, you know, there are uh, familial syndromes uh, such as Gorlin syndrome, which is in the hedgehog pathway. And, and so again, these are, these are quite rare, but especially in childhood cancers, it may be something that parents choose to, to follow up on. However, my second point is that, you know, uh, sending every child with childhood cancer to a geneticist, you know, there's uh, significant ethical implications there, not only for the child, but also for family members. And that's something to always keep in mind. Um, uh, the third point I wanted to make was just adding to uh, what the others have said in that in adult cancers, um, you know, we're still continuing to find these out. So whereas BRCA1 and BRCA2 were the first uh, well-known and identified breast cancer mutations, we know that data on breast cancer is coming out all the time. And there are constantly evolving classifications where things may not be associated, but that may change in the future as we get more information and more data. And there was, a, I was doing a literature search a little bit earlier today, and you know there have been 
Um, there's a study in the UK which identified more mutations that can be associated with brain cancer. So I think that the true answer is we don't have any uh, clear association yet, which is good, and brain cancers remain less frequent uh, than breast cancers. But I think we're, we're constantly refining our understanding of what may be associated with these cancers. Yeah, that's one of the challenges is early diagnosis. We don't really have anything great for doing that, uh, unfortunately. So these tumors have already progressed so far by the time uh, doctors know and Spears see them, uh, that it makes it much more challenging to treat. Okay, our next question. Um, I, this attendee says that they viewed a video by a neurosurgeon from PenMed uh, who talked about using gamma knife therapy for glioblastoma, uh, which he had copyrighted. Uh, so do you all have any comments about gamma knife therapy? That's a great question. Um, so there are some people who uh, would recommend that, um, and it, again, this goes back to sort of more of like a case by case type of basis. Um, and I think, you know, there certainly are people, I can give you a good example, you know, a patient, for example, who does not want to come in for multiple treatments and would rather have, you know, um, no surgery and would prefer just one treatment, you know, option that was quick and then they wanted to go and travel the world and, and do their thing. Um, they didn't want chemotherapy or anything like that. Um, and that certainly is an option. Um, you know, it's, again, I think every case is sort of a case by case type of thing where you're really trying to figure out what is it that, um, what is it that you, that you want, you know, is it something that, um, that you're okay with staying around for and sort of um, going through multiple treatments? Are you okay with chemotherapy? Are you okay with, you know, um, surgery or it, it's really a conversation. I think that, that you have to have. I absolutely agree with that. I think, um, you know, having that discussion with patients, but also make it, making it clear, um, when something is the standard of care and has a lot of data and recommendations behind it versus when something is, um, an alternative approach. Um, as long as patients understand that I am always willing to have that discussion to be in line with their wishes and their, their desires for their own, you know, this is their own life. Um, most of the time when we use a uh, gamma knife, it's uh, if they've already undergone standard therapy and perhaps there is an area that's small volume where we think we can give the high doses that come along with gamma knife um, in a small volume safely. And so that's where I've seen it's more commonly used. I will give you the historical precedent uh, with radiation where we went to really, really high doses on these tumors, higher than we typically go to nowadays, and it really showed no benefit. So in terms of asking whether gamma knife might have um, beneficial results just because you're potentially going to a higher dose relatively, I, I, I don't know that that's in keeping with the behavior, um, but if, as Dr. Mill alluded to, for other reasons, the patient wishes to have quality of life and um, uh, decrease the volume of radiation to the brain, it's something that can be discussed. Thanks. Um, our next comment and question. Uh, great presentation, Dr. No. What are your thoughts on the use of gliolin uh, in the use of adult malignant brain tumors? Oh, you, gliolin. Uh, so gliolin is um, basically a uh, recent um, development in brain tumor surgery and that uh, labels um, GBMs because it, it uptakes a particular type of chemical and then turns it into something that you can actually see under a microscope. Um, and it's a very, it's a very great tool. And I actually took out the slide in my slide presentation because I didn't want to get too, uh, too complicated with it. Um, but it is something that I, I like using. And, and in particular, you know, the best way that we use it is sort of, it's a, a solution that the patient has to drink a few hours before surgery. But um, it, during surgery, it basically lights up the tumors to a really beautiful type of pink color. Uh, that allows you to see where the tumor is uh, in the brain. And so it's a, a great tool to have, um, oftentimes uh, expensive, um, but uh, still one of the tools that we have in our armamentarium um, that, that's a, a great tool. And, I, and uh, we sort of hope to eventually at some point get it um, here in, uh, in Hawaii as well. Great. Uh, next question is for Dr. Spears. Uh, how new is proton therapy and is it offered to children here in Hawaii? So proton therapy is not new. Um, it has been used since the 1970s. Uh, one of the places that it's been used very frequently is one of the places that Dr. Mo um, trained, which is in Harvard. Um, I would say in the last five to 10 years, its use has spread 
um, to other places nationwide and of course worldwide. Um, I talk to um, patients about, or I talk to their parents rather about photons, but I try to be careful about that discussion. Not everyone has the resources or uh, the ability to go to the mainland and get treatment there. And protons do not have indications in everyone. There are certain types of, treat of tumors, even in children, where there's been shown to have uh, no benefit. There are, um, a proton specialist can tell you certain risks that may be higher with protons. So it's not a clear cut. Everyone should get protons all the time. And uh, with adults, it's even more controversial. And the treatment is very, very um, expensive. So uh, I have a discussion with the parents. I try to counsel them on what the potential benefit will be, offer them a consult uh, with a proton specialist if they're interested. But I, I never want parents to feel like they're depriving their kids um, of something if they just can't take them to the mainland to get treatment. So I always try to approach it as an option rather than a mandatory um, uh, uh, thing to do. And especially since some of the, sometimes the data is more speculative than um, actually there's a question that yeah, I think you hit on most of it, but it's another one coming up in just a minute uh, that I know Hawaii does not have proton beam facilities. Under what conditions would you recommend transporting patients for PBT, um, such as at La Jolla or MD Anderson? And also what are the trade-offs between using SBRT and PBT? Uh, so for the first question, it's um, a matter of uh, determining what are the parents' wishes. Uh, do they prefer to have their child here? Um, do they, do, are they okay with traveling? Do they have the resources to travel? If they're fine with that, um, we have a, a program where uh, we've sent children to Seattle Children's, um, to Radies in LA, uh, to uh, St. Jude's. Um, and, but, you know, really I ask the parents, uh, we have these existing programs. St. Jude's is wonderful. If, you're, if you go on a study, um, then uh, they will pay for everything. However, uh, to get to one of these places, um, in some cases, takes up to six weeks. And sometimes that's time that with brain cancer, we really don't have. So I always try to set expectations with, it may take some more time. Um, and is that something that everybody on the medical team is okay with? Um, so that's, that's that question. Um, from the standpoint of proton beam versus SBRT, two very different modalities. Um, SBRT is high doses to a very small volume. And, um, that's not always what we want with protons. Sometimes with protons, it's actually a very large volume. We're just trying to stop the, um, the area in the tissue and that it actually does lead to increased variability. So it depends on what the context is. Um, you don't always want protons. You don't always want SBRT. It depends on, on, um, it depends on the tumor type and the disease context. Great. Um, we had a question, I think must've been typed before your slide, Dr. Spears, about what the warning signs are and symptoms. So I think we can, we can jump over that one. Um, and we have another one here about genetic profiling and, and we just answered, I think you guys have answered that one pretty well. Uh, there uh, about there being very little that we can do in terms of predicting tumors based on genetic profiles. Someone asked um, about Alzheimer's disease, heredita is it hereditary? Um, and are certain adult brain cancers more common in certain, certain ethnic groups? Um, with the ethnic groups question, you know, uh, it's not it's not clear that there are any major differences in ethnicities uh, in Hawaii, at least. Um, although white patients tend to have a little bit more, uh, and then Native Hawaiians, and then our Asian populations, but it's they, there aren't huge differences as far as I'm aware. So this one is uh, so. Not, and we probably aren't going to get through them all, um, trying to get through as many as we can. But they will be, um, uh, we will be available. I, you can send questions in later uh, and definitely take a look at the website uh, to take another look at the slides and the, and the talk. Um, this one is five years ago, a patient fainted. Radiologist diagnosed the patient cancer due to lesions in the frontal lobe. Further scans ordered by the oncologist did not show evidence of metastasis. The patient recently diagnosed with dementia which had similar symptoms noted earlier. What are your recommendations? Uh, should they talk to an oncologist at their next appointment? Yeah, it would certainly, you know, I think the number one thing that you can do um, is to partner with your primary care provider because that really is the gateway and sort of key 
um, to really figuring out what's wrong. Uh, and you know, while we're experts here, we oftentimes see patients that have already been filtered through a really uh, big system. And so the number one thing, even going back to an earlier question where um, you're looking for signs of brain cancer and, and those types of things, you know, the, the number one thing you can do is have a, an ongoing conversation with your PCP, your primary care provider, and really letting them know, gosh, you know, something is a little bit different or something is a little bit off, or maybe this isn't right. You know, do you think we should get a brain MRI? Um, you know, and especially in a place like Hawaii where insurances can be challenging uh, to get imaging even in the first place, um, that makes the conversation with your primary care provider even more important because, because that's how things can get missed is if there is not an ongoing conversation. So really, I think that's where um, things should start and where um, patients should have sort of a really good established relationship is, is with your primary care. I um, great. Maybe just two more questions. This one, though, I think we should hit because I've heard this one every time I talk about brain cancer. Are there any lifestyle choices that increase your risk for brain cancer? Hmm. I would argue that some of the patients, I mean, that most of the patients that we've seen who've been diagnosed with brain cancers are like the healthiest people you have ever met, right? The prime of life, they exercise more than I do, they eat really well. Not that these things are positive or preventative, but, but it, it's, not, it's not a certain type of patient that comes in, I think, and I'd love to hear what the others say. Dr. No, any comment on that one? Um, nope, just that I agree. <laughs> I, I agree as well. Uh, and that's my <laughs> usual answer. There just isn't anything obvious. Um, so I think we'll close with this question because I like this one as, as our closer. How do you keep going on fighting this awful, terrible, challenging cancer? You know, I mean, have to see these patients. Yeah, no, at the end of the day, I mean, this is why really, I mean, you know, what it comes down to is, 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 is patients, right? I mean, these are the people that we see day in, day out. These are the people that we live next door to. Um, and so that's really what keeps me going. Um, and really what, what sort of uh, makes me even more uh, of a proponent for things like, you know, uh, helping people like, like Dr. Ramos, because we need people like him to be fighting on the front lines of figuring out a cure for this thing, you know, and in a lot of ways, I tell people, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm here just trying to sort of take care of the, the frontline stuff that comes through, but the people who are, who are doing the Manhattan Project in the back are, you know, are Dr. Ramos, and that, that's really where our attention and where most of our um, resources really should be put towards. Dr. Dr. Ramos, please. I'd love to hear what you say. Uh, for me, it's just one of the most challenging things. When you're going to commit your life to a certain type of research, you have to ask yourself, there's only so many hours in the day. You know, what are the, the most challenging things you can work on? Uh, and brain cancer is, is one of the most challenging cancers. There's so much about it that makes it hard to treat. Uh, Dr. No mentioned the blood-brain barrier. That makes it hard to get drugs into the brain, uh, for example. And he talked about the ultrasound as a way of getting around that. Um, so for me, it's, it's just where can you have the most amount of effect for the time that you put into your limited life of research. Um, and so that's why I've really focused on this particular cancer. Um, Dr. Spears, so you know, what, what would your answer be? I mean, you guys have said it all. I would just end with, you know, it's a privilege to treat patients that have brain cancers, um, not to diminish any, any type of cancer, but you know, the brain is the seat of our personality and to help patients fight for that, for their, for their quality of life and, and uh, to continue feeling the way they do, to continue interacting with the family the way they want to. Um, that's just a, 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 it's an honor to be a part of that process. It's difficult, but uh, as, as uh, difficult it might, as it might be for us, it is so much harder to go through it or to see a loved one go through it. So we actually have an easy job in that relationship. Thanks, I'm gonna bring the, the, the webinar to a close. I wanna remind our participants that they can take a survey that's there in the chat box uh, and that you'll get the, uh, the email sent to you soon as well. I also wanted to note that we uh, will continue the Starlight Lecture Series. Uh, the next one will be on June the 24th, again at 5 p.m. That one is gonna be on cancer and diabetes. Uh, so I definitely encourage everyone to attend that as well. 
Uh, I want to thank Dr. Spears and Dr. No for teaching us so much today and, and for spending this hour with us uh, and giving us an insight into this really, really challenging cancer. Uh, and with that, um, I'll close out the, the webinar. Thank you all for attending. Take a look at the Cancer Center website. You'll get the, the lecture there uh, and you'll get the, uh, the slides as well. And, uh, and thank you all. Thanks, Dr. No and Dr. Spears. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone.